up close and personal with Governor Mike Pence. I pray often that, uh, for a discerning heart. Plus, a wife and mom leads a double life. At night, I would be a completely different person. Until she gets busted. I was so disgusted with myself. I popped a bottle of Xanax. And I got up the courage and went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. Josh McDowell reveals the secret he hid for 50 years. Welcome, folks. We've got a great program. Hey, do you get upset about this release of this prisoner? Does that ring your bell at all? Well, I'd just like to know more. I'd like to have a little more information. You know, did, did he really desert yeah. his people? Because a lot of people are saying that he was a bad guy. So I'd like to have a little more info. All right. Well, I think you're, that's what General Dempsey said. Let's not convict somebody until we, he's innocent until proven guilty. But there's an awful lot of stuff coming out. And Americans are demanding answers. And lawmakers are fuming. They want to know why Obama surrendered top Taliban leaders to rescue one questionable American POW. That's right. The White House has called former POW Bo Bergdahl a hero, but his fellow soldiers are calling him a deserter. George Thomas has the latest. A new video released by the Taliban shows a clean-shaven Bergdahl dressed in Afghan clothes sitting in a pickup truck. Moments later, a Black Hawk helicopter lands and he's handed over to American Special Forces in Afghanistan. The exchange is made as dozens of Taliban fighters armed with AK-47s and rocket-propelled grenades watch on a nearby hillside. Bugdaw's release has sparked a huge controversy with his former soldiers, accusing him of deserting and putting American lives at risk. I feel like he deserted us. Um, I, he knew what he was doing when he deserted us. Uh, it was premeditated. Um, it was thought out. Fellow soldiers say the 24-year-old started complaining about America's role in Afghanistan early on, and just months into his deployment, he disappeared from his base, leaving his body armor, weapon, and helmet behind. The U.S. launched a massive search that resulted in the deaths of several American soldiers. People calling him a hero and people calling him this, uh, uh, this great soldier, I mean, it's a spit in the face to the soldiers who died as a direct result to him leaving. The Army says they will review Bogdan's case to see if any misconduct occurred. Meanwhile, his release has also backfired on the White House. Republicans want to hold hearings on whether the president broke the law by not consulting Congress on the deal to swap a U.S. prisoner for five senior Taliban leaders. Is ill-founded, it is a mistake, and it is putting the lives of American servicemen and women at risk. The president apparently told the Senate's top Democrat, Harry Reid, that the exchange was imminent, but just didn't tell any Republican leaders. It must have been either the day before or the day off. I don't remember for sure, Reid told Politico. Still, some Democrats are upset about how it all went down. I strongly believe that we should have been consulted. Bergdahl was held by the Taliban for five years. He's now in a military hospital in Germany and is expected to return to the United States later this week. George Thomas, CBN News. Well, folks, the deal was the Veterans Administration scandal was just rising, and the Obama was fighting uh, to prove that he did something, and uh, his poll numbers were plummeting because the veterans were getting a lousy deal, and uh, the hospitals were inefficient, and the entire mess was coming down on his head. So how does he do to get out of it? He gets one soldier and he says, look, I'm for soldiers. Here's this staff sergeant, and I've got him free. And uh, so I made a little swap for him without asking Congress. But I just wanted to do that because I'm president. And this is the way I look at it. And so I conferred with myself. And I said that I was doing OK. So my Justice Department and my staff and the White House told me that I could go ahead and do it. So I didn't have to consult Congress, Democrat, or Republican. But nevertheless, I'm going to have a Rose Garden ceremony, and I'm going to send Susan Rice to the Sunday morning shows. And so she's coming out and saying, this man served honorably and with distinction and all this stuff. And it turns out he's des a deserter. So they've got egg all over themselves, but it was a political move. Everything he does is political. 
Huh. I'd like you say, How do you really feel? Well, you know how it is. I'm, I'm so level-headed about it all. Well, a new report shows more widespread failure at America's veterans' hospitals. And now Republicans have a plan to give vets health care freedom. John Jessup has more of that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Here's John. Pat, Republicans proposed a bill to guarantee veterans will get the medical care they need. The bill drafted by four GOP senators would allow veterans to see a private doctor if they're forced to wait too long for an appointment at the VA. Meanwhile, the federal investigation into the VA scandal has exposed more abuse. In addition to the scandal surrounding the Phoenix Hospital, investigators uncovered secret waiting lists at Midwest hospitals in six other states, including Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. Over 100 veterans there waited for appointments for more than 90 days. A major re research hospital in Tennessee has laid off 1,000 workers because of Obamacare. Vanderbilt University Hospital took that step last year after projecting a $100 million drop in revenue under the new law. But the Tennessean reports the hospital saw an even bigger plunge, and now they're expecting a $250 million decline over the next two years. So now the hospital is taking other drastic steps, decreasing pay and benefits to preserve 2,000 other positions. Well, extreme weather battered states across the Midwest Tuesday. Torrential rains, high winds, and several tornadoes were reported in Iowa and Nebraska. 85 mile an hour winds uprooted trees, tore off roofs, and knocked over tractor trailers. Near Omaha, up to four inches of rain triggered evacuations. Hail the size of baseball slammed into houses, shattered windows, and smashed through car windshields. The severe weather arrived during an unusually quiet spring with far fewer documented tornadoes in May than in previous years. President Obama held a private meeting with the new president of Ukraine today. Petro Poroshenko was elected just 10 days ago, and he's vowing to retake parts of eastern Ukraine from pro-Russia separatists. The Ukrainian military is stepping up its offensive. Troops broke through rebel-held positions in the city of Slovyansk. Officials are warning residents in the city and surrounding areas to stay at home while they fight the insurgents. That warning comes as a Christian orphanage in Slovyansk was attacked by, was attacked rather, by pro-Russian insurgents. The city, the center rather, is partially supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. No children were hurt in the attack, but Orphan's Promise has moved all the kids to a safe place in western Ukraine. In Nigeria, 10 top military officers were found guilty of helping the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram by providing them with weapons and information. The convictions came months after reports from politicians and soldiers accused some senior officers of aiding the group. Secret information provided by the officers helped insurgents ambush military convoys and attack army barracks. Other allegations said that some soldiers even fought with the insurgents during attacks, then returned to army camps. Well, it's been a month and a half and nearly 300 schoolgirls are still being held hostage by Boko Haram. The kidnapping put a spotlight on that notorious group, which for more than five years has committed countless atrocities against Christians and others. Gary Lane has the story of one Nigerian schoolgirl who overcame a murderous assault on her family. Deborah Wakai Peters played with some of the 276 schoolgirls kidnapped by the Boko Haram terror group. She says her mother once attended the same school in Chibok, where the girls were kidnapped. Deborah has experienced her own horrors at the hands of Boko Haram. One night just before Christmas 2011, she watched as three gunmen entered her house and killed her father after he refused to deny Christ. They also killed her 14-year-old brother, Caleb. So they go ahead and shoot him twice in his chest. So he fall. When he fall, he started, like, moving. So, um... So they go ahead um, and shoot him again, one in his mouth, and then he fall down and died. So I was, I was in shock. I didn't know what was happening. Deborah's mother, a former Muslim, was away from home at the time. Shortly after, American children of 9-11 victims invited Deborah to attend a camp in the U.S. While she survived a terror attack, Deborah could not make it through the bureaucracy of the State Department. It twice denied her visa requests. And the reason she was denied a visa was they said to her, um, you can't make this stuff, off, this stuff up. They said to her, uh, you don't have family ties. And so they essentially re-traumatized a girl whose family was exterminated by, by terrorists. 
When Deborah talked to CBN News, she made it clear why Boko Haram targeted her family. In the Quran, they say that any Muslim woman that turned to Christian, her punishment is dead. So they did all this because of her. So you, you think if your mother had been home, they would have killed her as well? Yes, because they were targeting her even now. They are looking for her. If they see her, they will kill her. Why did they kill your father? Because one, number one, he's a pastor, and the second one, he married my mother. When he married my mother, so he turned my mother to Christian, so they were angry with him. Now, had, your, had your father led other Muslims to Christianity? Yeah. Ogebe suggests world leaders take a more aggressive response in order to stop these attacks. This is a make or break time for Boko Haram. If the world cannot unite and snuff them out now, they now know what will get our attention, and they're going to keep, you know, putting it in our faces. As for Deborah, she finally received a student visa and now attends school in the U.S. So what does she want people to learn from her story? They will understand um, and they will know more and more of what God said, and they will, like, understand what it means to stand strong. A 15-year-old Nigerian student standing strong in victory over Islamic terrorism and praying that her Christian friends will soon be reunited with their families. Gary Lane, CBN News. You can find more of Gary's exclusive reporting on his blog, The Global Lane, including his latest report on a Chinese crackdown on Christians. To access the blog, all you have to do is go to our website, cbnnews.com. And Pat, that's one brave young girl. Well, she sure is, and the rest of them are, too. And I tell you, what needs to be done, in all seriousness, that this group needs to be eliminated. And we have military force. I, I think if we had a, a company of Navy SEALs or maybe a couple of platoons would maybe make up a company, but a, a company size with full weaponry, and put them into that area where they are. We know where those people are. We have drone uh, intelligence. We have satellite intelligence. We can find out where they are. And uh, <clears throat> if we want to ask the Nigerians to give us some honest troops to back us up, that's fine. But go in there with full guns blazing and no mercy to those people. They're, they're, they're vicious killers. And they'll continue to kill and to rape and to rob until somebody does it, something to them. And we need to do that. We can do it. And uh, if you, President Obama wants to be a macho man, he can be macho man with a, a good a contingent of some of our well-armed people from uh, SEALs or Delta Force or whatever, but uh, fully armed and with all kinds of support material, especially air power. We can do it. Mm -hmm. We need to. Wendy? All right. Well, up next, the man who went from the cornfield to Congress to the governor's mansion. There's no rocket science to it. We're just putting into practice those common sense principles, of living within our means, letting people keep more of what they earn. Will his next stop be the White House? That's the question coming up. When it comes to finding true love. We've got a little surprise for you. All other dating shows don't have a prayer. Your church is about to play matchmaker. Oh my word. <laughs> Natalie Grant and congregations from coast to coast help one of the faithful find their chosen one. Tall, dark, handsome. He cries easy. It's posting it. It Takes a Church premieres tomorrow at 9, 8 central, only on Game Show Network. The American Bible Challenge is back. All new tomorrow. Jeff Foxworthy is ready to play. The whole family's gonna love it. Kurt Franklin's gonna sway. Are you ready? And you'll see the Bible in a whole new way. Don't I look chic? <laughs> that was impressive. The American Bible Challenge, all new tomorrow, 8, 7 central, only on Game Show Network. Tomorrow. I was thinking that He's gonna hurt me. The Atlanta boy who was kidnapped in his front yard and the song that set him free. God's my deliverer, yes he is. Then. D-Day was the watershed event of World War II. A veteran remembers the day of days 
after 70 years. The good Lord be with me. On the 700 Club. Something's happening in the heartland of America. Oklahoma, Kansas, Indiana. There's a moving toward very conservative pro-business principles, and the states are booming. Their economy is booming. Their unemployment rate is, is uh, going down, and jobs are being provided. It's a, it's a very refreshing thing. And uh, uh, the new governor uh, in Indiana is a guy named Mike Pence. He's a former congressman, a terrific guy. And he's fought to make his state business friendly. He's battled Washington over Medicare and Obamacare. And now some are saying that uh, Governor Mike Pence might even be presidential material. Well, we'll have to see about that. But our David Brody went out there to the heartland in Indiana for a closer look. When you meet Mike Pence, he's all American heartland, from a cornfield to Congress and now governor. I don't ever remember even imagining uh, that this grandson of an Irish immigrant would ever have the chance to lead my state as governor. And he's making the most of the opportunity with an approval rating over 60% and one of the top economies in the nation. Indiana uh, is open for tech business once again. We are grateful for your leadership and your vision. The numbers show a conservative blueprint for success. Seven straight months of job growth with unemployment under 6% leading the nation in new manufacturing jobs, plus throw in tax cuts and a budget surplus for good measure. There's no rocket science to it. We're just, uh, we're just putting into practice those common sense principles of living within our means, letting people keep more of what they earn. The Republican Party is taking notice. Some GOP bigwigs are courting Pence and the governor is listening. They see him as an ideal presidential candidate pro-life Christian, strong on social issues, a hawk on defense, and economically conservative. Governor Mike Pence and the First Lady of Indiana headed overseas today on a foreign trade mission. He's taking his platform to the international stage, and he's going to speak at national GOP functions, stoking presidential interest even further. All right, now look, every time we speak, I always have to ask you a president. You know I'm going to ask you a presidential. We did this last time. We always do this. Just a couple years ago, Congressman Pence and I discussed a 2012 presidential run right there in his D.C. office after he won a conservative straw poll. This is the part of the interview where, where I ask you the obligatory 2012 uh, question, and this is the obligatory part where you just say, oh, you know, uh, honored to be considered. So, so let's just go through the formalities here. <laughs> All right. So here we are again, two years later, trying to figure out a more unique way to pop the question. Forget about what you think. What, when Karen and the family hear these, uh, they read the newspaper, they have Google, don't they? What do they think? Forget about you. <laughs> well, I can tell you, our, any time that, that, that I'm mentioned for the highest office in the land, is a, it, it's a humbling uh, uh, and an encouraging thing for me and for my family. But our focus is on Indiana. He's also keenly aware that the best solutions need to come from outside the Beltway. And I'm absolutely convinced that the cure for what ails this country is going to come more from our nation's state capitals than it ever will from our nation's capital. There are just things that states will always be able to do better. And Pence has his hands full proving that. One challenge is Obamacare. I think uh, Obamacare needs to be repealed lock, stock and barrel. Pence says he won't take available federal money to expand Medicaid here unless it's done the Indiana way. We're not interested in expanding traditional Medicaid. Um, but if we could, in effect, end traditional Medicaid in Indiana for virtually all of our citizens and replace it uh, with the kind of uh, consumer-driven health care enshrined in the Healthy Indiana Plan, that we would be open to that. Some conservatives criticize Pence for even considering to take the federal money. The Federalist website says, quote, there is really nothing all that conservative about the state-specific plans to capture federal dollars earmarked for Medicaid expansion. The Healthy Indiana plan is popular with Hoosiers, though, because it sets up personal health savings accounts. Pence touts it as a national model. In a word, Indiana has proven in the last six years that consumer-driven health care works. 
The other big issue, education and Common Core. Pence picked up praise for making Indiana the first state to opt out of the controversial national curriculum, but critics complain that his new standards look a lot like Common Core. Influential conservative Michelle Malkin says Pence's attempts to mollify critics by rebranding and repackaging shoddy Common Core standards is fooling no one. Uh, whatever differences people might have uh, on the standards that we've produced, um, there's no doubt these, these were written by Hoosiers for Hoosiers. Uh, and the debate now uh, ultimately is happening here in the state of Indiana where it belongs. One item not up for debate, his faith. Just about each and every day, I like to start out my day with a, a little bit of time in the book, a little bit of time in prayer. Um, and that's become even more important to me uh, as I've shouldered the responsibilities of this office. Pence gave his life to Jesus as a college freshman, and now as governor, he's mindful of Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 3, where it says, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? It's a prayer I pray often, that uh, for a discerning heart to distinguish between right and wrong. For as he asked, who is able to govern this great people of yours? And in Indiana, it's Governor Pence for such a time as this. David Brody, CBN News, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, I don't know if David's going to sign up for his campaign committee and leave us. <laughs> <laughs> he really, that was a valiant yeah. effort, David, to get to pop that question. Yeah, though. well, <laughs> I mean, but you've got, you've got these, these governors like, you know, like John Kasich in Ohio. You've got a tremendous governor in uh, Wisconsin. You have a tremendous governor in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a tremendous governor in Indiana. That whole core, the heartland of America, has got a, a great resurgence, and we're so thrilled to see men of that caliber taking leadership. And they, they, they're going to, they come up with the innovations that Washington only dreams about. It's going to make it harder to decide who to select for president. Well, it, it is, but boy, I mean, he's a, a extremely appealing human really being. Is. Okay. Well, coming up, he's a famous Christian author and speaker who was a victim of sexual abuse. I can't put into words how you feel at nine years old when that happens. You feel isolated. I don't think I ever experienced so much fear in my whole life because you feel you're all alone. Josh McDowell reveals the secret he kept hidden for 50 years after this. Pat Boone here with a question. Which asset class has grown five-fold over the last decade? It's not stocks, not bonds, not even real estate. Precious metals, that's right, silver and gold are real money, and they have been for thousands of years. They're a trustworthy dollar alternative and money worldwide. Best of all, precious metal prices are still within reach for every American. I've been suggesting buying precious metals for years now, and to show you how sincerely I mean it, my friends at Swiss America will send you a free silver ingot just for making time to discuss the value of owning some gold and silver as wealth insurance. Why don't you call them now at the number below or visit SwissAmerica.com and you'll be rewarded in silver. Life's full of dark clouds. Swiss America can help you find their silver and gold lining today. In a land where freedom belongs to the brave, a true story of one girl's unshakable faith. We must attack the Yankee villages. And reclaim the hunting ground of our fathers. Fighting the ultimate battle for survival. Now you become Indian children. Her faith becomes her freedom. God will never leave us or forsake us. Alone. For more than 50 years, Josh McDowell has been a leading defender of the Christian faith. And yet, during most of that time, Josh harbored a terrible secret, one that he revealed to our Scott Ross. When Josh McDowell speaks, young people listen. 10 million of them in 115 countries over his career. He's well known for writing evidence that demands a verdict. Ironically, Josh tried his best to disprove Christianity as a college student. 
When his research led him to the truth of God's existence and moreover his love, Josh committed his life to sharing that truth with passion. He's happily married to Dottie and they've known a rich family life with their four children. His own youth was quite a different story. Let's let's backtrack a little bit talking about that. That was not your background. You, no. your, your dad had My some dad issues. My dad was an alcoholic and then was severely sexually abused. Oh, you were? Yeah. With your dad being an alcoholic, so forth, what did that, how did that affect your view of life or oh, fatherhood? Well, not with, when you have an alcoholic father, I always felt it was my fault and that I wasn't worth having a relationship with. Huh. That's how a lot of that uh, comes out. And so it affects your self-image, that you're uh, not, not valuable as a son mm -hmm. because he never once said, I love you or kiss me or took me anywhere to be alone with me. Every time he took with me, somewhere to unload the truck or something like that. There was always a reason uh, for it. Where was your mother doing all this? Well, my mom was sick quite a bit. She couldn't handle a lot of it. Uh, but I'd go out in the bar and I'd see my mother lying in the gutter and manure behind the cows where my dad had just taken a milk hose and beat her to a bloody pulp Good until grief. she couldn't stand up. And I'd be kicking him, beating on him at nine, 10 years old, saying, when I'm strong enough, I'll kill you. Josh's father was just one source of pain. When I was six years old, uh, my parents hired a man by the name of Wayne Bailey to work on the farm as a cook and a housekeeper. And from that day on, whenever my mother would go downtown shopping or my folks go away for the weekend, whatever, my mother would literally march me into Wayne Bailey and say, now you obey him. You do everything he tells you to do. And if you're disobedient, you'll get a thrashing when I get home. And uh, so what do you do at six years old? You do what Wayne Bailey tells you. At nine years old and 12 years old, I got up the courage and went to my mother and told her, and she wouldn't believe me. And I can't put into words how you feel at nine years old when that happens. <laughs> you feel isolated. I don't think I ever experienced so much fear in my whole life because you feel you're all alone. Here's a man doing these things to you and there's nothing you can do and those that are supposed to protect you would not believe you. The abuse stopped a year later when Josh was finally big enough to push the man away. He made it through high school but had another heartbreak just around the corner. And I heard my mother crying. It was a Saturday night, just crying loudly. And I ran through the house into her bedroom and. She sat up in bed and I said, Mom, what's wrong, what's wrong? She said, your father has broken my heart. She reached out and put her arms around me and she said, I've lost the will to live, son. All I, whew, well, all I want to do is live until you graduate and I just want to die. And uh, two months later I graduated and the next Friday at 13th she up and died. Where did the encounter with God come from? How did that happen for you? It came out of anger, bitterness, resentment. I met some students at the university and professors whose lives were really different. So he made friends with them and asked one girl why they were so loving to everyone. Her answer, Jesus Christ. And I blew up. I said, don't give me that garbage. I'm sick and tired of that trash of religion and church and Bible and God and Christians. And then she said, I didn't tell you. Uh, the church of the Bible were Christians, I told you the person of Jesus Christ. I apologized to her because my mother hadn't raised me to be rude, but then she challenged me to intellectually examine the scriptures as the Word of God and Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, which I thought was a joke. I really did. I truly believe Christians had two brains. One was lost, the other was out looking for it. Huh. I thought Christians were walking idiots. So Josh accepted her challenge and traveled throughout Europe, hoping to gather evidence to disprove Christianity. But all he found did the opposite. What was written down was true. Jesus had actually done that, and he had actually said that. And that led to a process then of returning to the university where I couldn't sleep. And I leaned back in my chair, cut my hands behind my head. I said, it's true, it's true, it's true. And so that December the 19th at 8.30 at night, I became a Christian. McDowell wasted no time in telling others what he'd discovered. 
After five decades of talking to and with young adults, he's an expert on youth culture. This is why everywhere I go, I talk about my wife. I'm one of the luckiest men in the world to be married to Dottie because my greatest platform is not with all my degrees, everything else, it's not all my books, everything. It's that I'm known as a man who loves his wife and spends time with his children. That opens more, I speak as a daddy. Josh's latest book and companion DVD bring to life the whole painful truth of his childhood. Undaunted is a stunning story of forgiveness and transformation. Somebody's gonna write your obituary someday. What do you want to say? He was known for loving his wife and spending time with his children. Not writing books, not doing TV, not videos, no. No. And if there's any one phrase, it would be that God became man, his name is Jesus, and he is passionate about a relationship with you. Oh, wow, powerful. Mm. Well, Josh McDowell, I just have to tell you that your book, More Than a Carpenter, helped lead me to Christ more than 20 years ago. And I just want to thank you for that and for uh, this incredible. If you, if you want to find out more about Josh McDowell's life from his book and DVD, we've got them right here. Uh, they're both called Undaunted. We've got the DVD and the book, and they're available nationwide. Pat, that was riveting. It is. It's so moving because it came from his heart, and you can see it. it he, he is reliving that pain. What a horrible experience to go through, and to him to come out so gentle and kind and loving and a wonderful father and husband. So many times when you see these people that have incredible ministries and books yeah. and platforms like, like Josh McDowell, like Joyce Myers, there's a very painful past. Yeah, well, it and, was his case. Well, yeah. Well, still ahead, uh, we've got your email. One viewer writes, when we say the salvation prayer is salvation instant, and can salvation be lost? We'll answer that question and much more when we bring it on after this. When it comes to finding true love. We've got a little surprise for you. All other dating shows don't have a prayer. Your church is about to play matchmaker. Oh my word. <laughs> Natalie Grant and congregations from coast to coast help one of the faithful find their chosen one. Tall, dark, handsome. Who cries easy? It's close. Uh, it takes a church. Premieres tomorrow at 9, 8 central, only on Game Show Network. What is his name? His name is Jesus. Today, own the most important chapter in the greatest story ever told. Come with me, and I will give you a whole new life. Son of God. Own it on Blu-ray and DVD today. Ready to pay less for long-distance home phone service and get more? Vonage is just $9.99 a month for a full six months. That's our best offer ever. Vonage is a home phone service that lets you call from your home or mobile phone. If you're ready to get more and pay less, visit Vonage online or call today. Welcome back to the 700 Club. 25 years ago today, Chinese troops cracked down on pro-democracy protesters in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. China's brutality left hundreds dead and plunged the country into chaos. Every June 4th, the communist government tightened security. But on this 25th anniversary, it's even tougher. One China expert says the Tianan Tiananmen's crackdown actually helped church growth in China. A Loyola University professor says the massacre caused many Chinese elites to lose faith in communism and embrace Christianity. By some estimates, there are now more than 100 million Christians in China. A Tea Party challenger could unseat a six-term Senate Republican. Tea Party candidate Chris McDaniel has virtually tied Senator Thad Cochran in the Mississippi Republican primary. Now they're looking at a possible runoff vote on June 24th. Meanwhile, Republicans believe they've made other gains in Tuesday's primaries that could put them on track to regain control of the Senate. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. What can that be? 52-year-old male complaining of chest pain. Clear. Heart attacks can happen at any time. My name is Dr. Crandall, and as a cardiologist, I tell my patients that they need to be aware of the hidden symptoms of a heart attack. Here's the truth. If you suffer cardiac arrest outside of a hospital, you have just a 7% chance of surviving. That is why I've created the Simple Heart Test to help you determine your own risk of heart disease. Go online today 
and in just two minutes, you'll discover your risk of suffering a heart attack, how you score on my heart disease risk factor scale, plus the key warning signs your heart is in trouble. Over two million Americans have already taken my simple heart test, and I urge you to do so now before it's too late. Take your free online heart test today and discover how to get Dr. Crandall's bestseller, The Simple Heart Cure. Go to simpleheartest.com today. Tomorrow, I was thinking that he was gonna hurt me. The Atlanta boy who was kidnapped in his front yard and the song that set him free. God's my deliverer, yes he is. Then, D-Day was the watershed event of World War II. A veteran remembers the day of days after 70 years. The good Lord be with me. On the 700 Club. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Well, Pat, as you know, we have many wonderful viewers of the 700 we Club, do. and they often write to tell us what they like about the show. Holy Karen writes, first of all, I would like to say that I watch your program most nights and that I am encouraged and uplifted by watching the 700 Club. I want to thank you for all that you're doing to make this televised program possible and also for all that you're doing to help people in other countries and the orphans. Well, Thanks, Karen. Sweet. Thank you, Karen. And Joanne writes, uh, she says, thank you so very much for being there when people need someone to pray with. Thank you very much for the times you've prayed for me. Recently, I was accused of doing something at work, which I did not do. As a result, I had to go to work in a different department than I normally work in, and my hours were cut. Of course, I prayed, but one day the Lord told me to call your prayer line. A wonderful prayer counselor spoke with me and prayed with me. The authorities said the accusation was unfounded. God gave me complete favor. I am now back in my department doing my own job, and my accuser is now gone. God answers prayer. That's wonderful. All right, let's get some questions. Okay, email. <coughs> viewer writes, when you truly are sorry to God and repent by saying the salvation prayer, is salvation instant? Is it permanent? If not, can it be lost? Well, you've asked a lot of questions that theologians have been debating for centuries, so it's not something I can handle in two or three minutes. But first of all, <clears throat> the Bible says, I was reading today in the eighth chapter of Romans, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. And uh, if we give ourselves to the Lord, the Spirit of God comes within us, and the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And so uh, you go to John, First uh, John, and he said, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other, and the blood of Christ continually cleanses us from all sin. So the whole idea is <clears throat> you have given yourself to the Lord, <clears throat> you have accepted him, and now you're walking with him. You're, the Spirit of God comes within you. When you give yourself to Jesus, it's a transaction where the Holy Spirit comes in. It isn't some creed. It isn't some attendance in some church. It isn't some outward thing. It is the Holy Spirit coming within you. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. So there's a relationship. And then you walk in the, in the, in the, the Spirit, walk in the Word according to His uh, teaching. That's, that's what it's all about. And then you don't have to worry about, am I going to... Am I in or not? You know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about am I saved? You know, I think I'd like to go to heaven, and we think about heaven, and Paul said, I've done everything that I might attain the resurrection of the dead. But in terms of, you know, is God going to kick me out of heaven? It, 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 we're adopted into the family of God. And <clears throat> you can't imagine an adoptive child. You say to him, now, if you don't eat your peas at dinner, I'm going to kick you out of the family. I mean, you know, it doesn't work that way. God loves you, and it's a walk. Mm. All right. It's a walk. That's a good word. Mm. Well, Nicholas writes, I'm 20, and I've never really had trouble sleeping until now. Lately, I've been wide awake at night, and it feels impossible for me to go to sleep. I pray to get tired, but it doesn't help. Why won't God make me sleep if he's able to do that? Well, God doesn't make people sleep, but it, it may be your trouble. There's either uh, you've got something going on in your, your business or your life that's exciting. I mean, it's something that's a challenge ahead of you, or else there's something you feel guilt about. But mostly it's a challenge, and your mind is stimulated over these things. So you need to get some rest. I'm a great fan of melatonin. It's, it's a tremendous thing. It's, it's a 
it's a hormone, but it's natural and it doesn't hurt you. But one milligram, two milligrams, you, you take it. If it makes you feel dopey and sleepy the next day, then you've taken too much, but it won't hurt you. And yeah. um, some of the aging people, uh, who, who the, the, the professors who teach on, on uh, longevity indicate that uh, melatonin is really good for you. So. Uh, and Nicholas, he's praying to get tired. I know that if I have a good workout during the day, that helps yeah. me sleep better at night. Sure. So well, well, maybe it, it, it sometimes does and sometimes it doesn't. Well, that's true. It depends on what time. It, it you... doesn't, but I mean, mm -hmm. before you go to bed, don't spend a lot of time I'm watching exciting television. Don't spend a lot of time reading exciting books. And don't be thinking about business deals or don't be worrying. But mm. melatonin. <laughs> All right. An hour or so before you go to bed. All right. Okay, another viewer <coughs> writes Who wrote the book of James? Did Jesus have a brother and a disciple by that name? Well, he calls himself the brother of the Lord. You find in other instances, it's James, the brother of the Lord. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're to presume that the book of James, you know, uh, Martin Luther called it the epistle of straw. Well, Martin Luther didn't like what he was saying in there, but nevertheless, uh, the thought is he, he identifies it, James, the brother of the Lord. So right. let's take him to what he says. Well, this is an interesting question, Pat. Abraham writes, I was just wondering if God has a sense of humor. Well, I mean, he wouldn't have us doing television if he didn't have a sense of humor. Come on. <laughs> of, course he, yeah, of course he has a, you know, the laughter comes from the Lord. There's joy in the morning. You know, you, you read, uh, where were you when I uh, created the earth and, and, and the morning stars sang for joy? Hmm. You know, you see that the morning star, the, 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 in, in all of the universe, there, there's the, the, the song of joy. God is a God of joy. Of course he is. He's not a God of gloom and doom. He's a God of joy. At least I think so. I believe you. I right. believe it. Keith okay. writes, I am a 74-year-old, spirit-filled seminary graduate and Bible teacher. I have received several called out healings for lower back trouble and diabetic leg pain on the 700 Club, as well as one with laying on of hands in a healing service. In all cases, I claimed the healings and felt the power of God. but. The healings lasted three or four days and then fizzled out. I don't understand why I can't stay healed. Of course, you don't believe you're entitled to it. Peter was that. He was walking on the water. And all of a sudden, he looked at the waves, and he began to think, I'm out here. I'm, I'm, I'm a fisherman. I'm out here walking on water in the Sea of Galilee. I, and the minute he started thinking that, he began to sink. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus has healed you. Begin to thank him and praise him and don't stop praising him and don't let doubt come into your mind. But the devil will do everything he can to take a healing away from you and he will put doubt in your mind, just like happened to Peter on the water, great apostle. And he starts to sink because his mind got off of Jesus and onto the waves. Get your mind off the way. Stop looking at your symptoms. Well, I, I really, I, I, my, my, my hand should really not feel this good. Hmm. No. Praise God, my hand is fixed. I'm done. Okay. Believe that you've received what you've asked for in prayer. And continue to hmm. hold on to it. Don't yeah. let go. Amen. Well, Leo Beetle is a computer whiz. But Leo wasn't as smart when it came to managing money. His family was deep in debt until they found a way to get out of debt. Leo and Rena Beadle didn't worry much about finances. He made a good living as a network systems engineer for an oil company. Then Leo started his own computer business, and the trouble started. We went into this business with no capital, no real business plan, no real customers. The first two years, Leo struggled to build his client base. By this time, the couple had five boys. They used credit cards to pay for their personal and business needs. Soon, they were $60,000 in debt. We were always trying to borrow from Peter to pay Paul. We were paying minimum payments, and it just kept running a tab. Eventually, the couple fell behind on bills and couldn't pay their mortgage. They filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy and lost their home. I went through every room, and I sat on that packed box. <laughs> And I said goodbye. And I thanked God for the times that we had had there. The family moved into an apartment and had to use food stamps and shop at secondhand stores for their kids. John, their oldest son, remembers when they went to a thrift store to buy him shoes. 
50 cents I think we paid for these one pair of shoes and the sole was not even there. It was like the weirdest thing. I remember feeling uh, the very bottom of the shoes. One day the couple was watching the 700 Club and made a donation. Later, CBN sent them a teaching on finances. The Beatles learned how to live on a budget and consistently tithe. God says, test me in the tithe and you give me and you see if I won't open the windows of heaven. A few months later, Leo received an email from a friend about a systems engineer position that paid $90,000. This is kind of like God saying, okay, I see your heart. It's like, it's like the prodigal when he turns and the father comes right into him. That's what I felt like. Rena also got a full-time job with a local newspaper. Then a year later, they were selected to participate in the TV reality show, Meet Mr. Mom. They won $25,000. They knew it wasn't luck. He will get money to you, you know, in the strangest ways sometimes. The couple built up their savings and stayed out of debt. They also taught their sons about the importance of living on a budget and tithing. I mean, I've tithed my checks. Since I've had a job, I've given to the you know, back into the house of God. Leo has landed an even higher paying job. The Beatle family says being obedient and trusting God leads to financial blessings. God was there in everything. So we were able to come out a success. Just give, just be obedient. Obey the Father and you will reap what you sow. A couple things in that story that you need to, to be aware of, first of all, if you are capable of handling your money properly, God will give you more of it. And I, I think the trouble with them at first was that they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't watching. Um, I, I talked to a Jewish rabbi, a dear friend who was here on the show, and uh, I said the, the Hebrew word uh, is, is money. Uh, and you, we've got that word in English, money, and it has to do with currency, he said, but it also has to do with wisdom. It has to do the, the concept of that word is wisdom. And the people who have wisdom and understanding are the ones that have the money. So you have to learn how to handle it. And so once you say, okay, I've learned how to handle it, I'm a good steward, God will start putting it in your hand. And the other thing, of course, is they give and it'll be given unto you. So he, he stopped the leakage on the one hand and he opened the windows of heaven on the other and look what happened. Hey, we've got something we want to give you. It's called Living Under God's Blessing. And there's a teaching I did uh, at the Feast of Tabernacles over in Jerusalem and it was really an anointed time. I could hardly stand up. There was such an anointing in that room. Um, and. Uh, it, it, it's something that's here. Gordon has a teaching in here, both of us, to, so you can have Living Under God's Blessing, a, a CD, a DVD. And I don't know. I, I keep all these initials. This is a DVD. It works on your... <laughs> yes, uh, works on oh, You see the picture. You see the picture. All right. That's the and DVD. The CD, you can listen to it. Now, this is a DVD, and we'll give that when you join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day. Pick up the phone. Call in 1-800-759-0700. And there's more. And here is Wendy. All righty. Thanks, Well, Up next, she promised to save herself for marriage. And then she was raped. I had kept my promise, but God had not kept his. And he had, had failed me. And so I just decided that if that's what he was going to do to me, then watch what I was about to do to him. See where that threat led this woman when we come back. We were making high car payments. We had a lot of credit card debt. Giving was often the last thing we would think of. When we watched Pat teach, we decided that we needed to be giving 10% of our income. Then um, I landed a higher paying job and we had more income coming in. Even though we don't know, What's going to happen? We know he's going to take care of things for us. Because he's never let us down. We're Tim. And Yvette Weber. And, and we, we give, give to, to CBN. CBN. Even though Instaflex is now the number one selling joint supplement at GNC, there are still too many people suffering with joint discomfort who haven't experienced the Instaflex difference. So now the makers of Instaflex are on a mission to give out as many complimentary two-week samples of Instaflex as we can in the next 24 hours. These complimentary samples are not available in stores, and to guarantee your sample, you must call now, 1-800-963-0946. Instaflex is number one at GNC because it's our most powerful joint relief formula ever. In a clinical study at a major university, Instaflex was shown to significantly reduce joint discomfort. 
Experience the difference now with your complimentary sample. Instaflex is available at GNC, Walgreens, and these fine retailers, but you can only get your complimentary two-week sample by calling 1-800-963-0946. We want to give out as many complimentary Instaflex samples as we can in the next 24 hours, so call and guarantee yours now, 1-800-963-0946. Welcome back. A little program note. We've got a treat for you tomorrow. I hope it's a treat. Got that great big horse, Ufano, doing some rather beautiful dressage moves. I think you will find it very stirring, and uh, it'll be on the show tomorrow. So if you like watching me do stuff, it'll be there. If you like watching a beautiful horse, it'll be there. So uh, tune in tomorrow. You don't want to miss that one. It's really good. The Grand Prix dressage with Ufano. Well, by day, Casey Van Norman played the role of a loving wife and mother. But at night, she morphed into a stranger. Casey lived the double life for years until her secret identity was busted by her own husband. When Casey Van Norman was 13, her parents divorced. As a child, not having my father present, just that question of why was I not enough, you know? And so 13, 14, 15, I really wrestled with this feeling of insecurity and unworthiness. Those feelings would only get worse. Casey became a Christian and at 15 attended a conference where she made a promise to God to save herself for marriage. A few months later, she was raped by an older man. What I really felt in that moment was that I had kept my promise, but God had not kept his, and he had had failed me. And so I just decided that if that's what he was going to do to me, then watch what I was about to do to him. Soon, Casey was taking drugs and having sex. She also started cutting and became bulimic. I used every Band-Aid you could think of, sex, alcohol, drugs, popularity. After years of struggling, Casey recommitted her life to Christ and started turning her life around. She met and married Justin and had two children, but she hadn't learned to accept God's gift of love. I wanted to work for for Him. I wanted to earn that love. As long as I could stay busy in the things of God, everybody would think that I was of God. As much as she tried, she couldn't get rid of the feelings of insecurity and unworthiness and soon returned to old habits. During the day, I would live this, what looked to be this very righteous, moral life. And at night, I would be a completely different person, cutting my arm just to experience one moment of power, sticking my finger down my throat. Justin admits he didn't know what was happening to his wife. I was busy providing for our family, trying to earn a good living. We were teaching Sunday school and doing things at the church. I basically stopped being romantic with with Casey. I, I stopped. Uh, taking her out on dates. But a fellow church member was ready to give Casey all the attention she wanted. Uh, Another man began to pursue me, began to notice things that Justin didn't seem to notice anymore. And uh, I responded. It was the beginning of a three-year-long affair. Eventually, Justin uncovered it while going through some phone records. Though it was hard, Justin forgave his wife. In that moment, it all became very clear to me that I was at much at fault in letting the guard down and the boundaries down that we should have had in our marriage that we didn't. But Casey was still overcome with guilt. I was so disgusted with myself and I really believed that my family and my husband would be better off without me. I, I, I popped a bottle of Xanax and the whole thing of uh, alcohol and prayed to end it. At that moment, a close friend happened to be out running errands. He put it on my friend's heart to specifically and urgently get to Casey Van Norman's house. The house was not locked, and, and I was there, I was passed out. And I know that if I had stayed in that, that way for any amount longer, my heart would have stopped. God used her as a vessel to save my life. As she recovered physically and emotionally, Justin was there by her side. Casey says his response helped her to finally understand God's love. I'd been a Christian all this time, and I didn't fully grasp grace. 
And for him to look at me and say, Casey, I don't know how to not love you. This was the Spirit of God in him offering me forgiveness and grace so that I would experience grace. And now I get to go and tell everyone this story that God is saying these words to you, which is, I don't know how to not love you. Casey says she stopped cutting and was also freed from her struggle with bulimia. She and Justin then began restoring their marriage. We began to weed out certain relationships, place higher boundaries in our marriage, and then communicate. We share our hearts with one another like we've never have before. Intimacy is way stronger now than it ever was. When you look at a marriage, it's the one thing on planet Earth that God has given us to look at and say, this is how I love my church. Casey and Justin now work at a ranch in Texas that houses women who have been saved from sex trafficking. Casey is also a published author and a featured speaker at women's conferences. She shares her story so that others might experience the gift of God's love. He is in control of every moment. He is the author of our life. And when you begin to experience Him on that level, everything changes. It is so empowering. It sets us free to truly live. What a husband. But the husband represented Jesus. I don't know how not to love you. Isn't that something? God doesn't know how not to love us. As far as the East is from the West, that's how far He'll take our sins from us. Everything. Again, Romans 8, 28, God works everything together for good to them that love Him. We're overcoming. I'm more than conqueror. We're more than conquerors through Him that loved us. God's love will never stop. You have not sinned away your chance of salvation. God loves you. Pray with me right now. These words, Jesus, say it. Jesus, I take your love, and I thank you that you love me, and I receive that love now. Come in. Take over my life. From this moment on, I will walk in the grace of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, please call us. Our, our, we're going off the air in just a second, but the telephones will be there. 1-800-759-0700. Just say, look, I prayed. Talk to somebody on the phones. We've got people who love you, and you need to call. Well, I want to thank each one of you for joining us on today's broadcast. We leave you with our power minute from Proverbs. Uh, he who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Well, that's all the time we've got. Tomorrow, you're going to meet the Atlanta boy who was kidnapped in his front lawn, and uh, <clears throat> there's a song that set him free. And we've also got uh, a wonderful little uh, piece uh, with me and a great big beautiful horse. And I think if you like animals and you like, you like what God can do for, in people's lives, we'll show that to you. That'll be on the show tomorrow. You don't want to miss it. So for Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. My sister was born with a cleft lip and palate. She coughed and choked when I tried to feed her. So she was malnourished. I was sure this would affect the development of her brain. The Ma's knew Shaoling's lip would only get worse, and no one they asked could help. Then they heard about CBN, and we arranged for free surgery. I saw my mom smile for the first time in a long time. Xiaoling is like a princess. These are the things you make possible when you partner with CBN. Thousands of people around the world begin new lives because you cared enough to give. To those of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club, thank you. Your help will make a tremendous difference in so many lives. Be sure to watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. Because when we all come together to help, miracles happen.